In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, on this last Sunday of the liturgical year, uh, Holy Mother Church gives us the gospel reading of our Lord prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. As you know, the city of our Lord was destroyed because it never received its Savior. God allowed for the Roman armies to come in about 40 years afterwards and destroy the city and the temple completely. So this was actually done, and it's an historical event, but uh, the wisdom of the church, or Mother Church, has determined that this is a very good image of what will be the general judgment, the second coming of our Lord, when he judges the good and the evil. So a theme that we can take for this uh, Mass of today is that justice must not only be done, justice must be seen to be done. You know, souls will be in heaven or hell permanently based already on the particular judgment. When each of us dies, we face our Lord, the judge of the living and the dead, immediately, and he determines whether we're going to be in heaven or hell for eternity. So some might say, well, then why do we need a general judgment? Why do we need that all the millions and billions of the peop of people that have ever existed be all called together in one sort of hyper stadium uh, someplace uh, to determine, uh, to, to show everyone what are all the good deeds of everyone or what are all the evil deeds of everyone? And the answer is so that we can give more glory to God. That's the answer. The general judgment is all about giving glory to God. All the world will see all the good acts that were ever done by all the good people, and all the world will see all the wicked deeds that have ever been done by all the wicked people. And both things are going to give more glory to God, to see the good rewarded and to see the evil punished. Because it's all about how much we come into line with the one principle of measuring, and the one principle of measuring is the divine word, our Lord Jesus Christ. As much as those of us who hopefully imitate him and are like him are going to be shown to the whole world to be the ones who give glory to him. And those who indefinitely and forever will not give glory to him are going to be shown to the whole world how much they are not like our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reward for the good and the punishment for the wicked equally are going to be glory to God. And, you know, that's kind of hard for our world to listen to because one of the first arguments that we come up with, or that I should say modern man comes up with for um, kind of saying that no one is in hell, they say, well, God is so good. You know, God is so good. Uh, therefore, no one's ever going to be judged and no one will go to hell. But if that were to happen, if God would be so good, quote unquote, that he wouldn't judge anyone and no one would go to hell, then his goodness would mean nothing. And in fact, there would be no goodness because uh, goodness is uh, the principle. Either you have a lot of it or you have very little of it. And uh, if you have very little of it and you don't meet up to the one who is all good, if he bends and said, well, it says, if that doesn't matter, then he's compromising his own goodness, and then there would be no goodness. So, how many good things happen in this life, in this world, and they are never, ever known? Think of all the saints and all the virtuous acts. These people have gained merit. This merit they have offered to God for the conversion of sinners. They've offered it to God for the sanctification of sinners, including ourselves. All of us are somehow profiting, profiting from the hard work of saints that went before us. And hopefully we are doing our own job of gaining merit for our own sanctification, but also for the sanctification of other souls. Think of the young virgin martyrs from the Roman era, whose very death converted the people around them. This week, we, we will be celebrating the Feast of St. Cecilia and also St. Uh, Catherine of Alexandria. But I would like to focus on this virgin martyr, St. Agatha, who was a, a young lady who 
consecrated her virginity to our Lord at the age of 15. And shortly after, the governor of the city where she lived, his name was Quincianus, he wanted her to marry him. And uh, young Agatha said, no, I can't because my virginity already belongs to the Lord of heaven and earth. The governor was angry with her because he was a pagan. It was a time of uh, uh, Roman persecution under the emperor Datius. Datius, uh, sorry, Quincianus contacted Datius and said, you know, this girl won't marry me and I'm a governor. So Datius gave him permission to persecute her, which he did. So we're talking a few hundred years after the life of our Lord, but still the early church. So this governor had her tortured in different ways and her body was wounded. She was put back in the prison, still alive, and St. Peter appeared to her. St. Peter from the first century appearing to this um, young virgin from the fourth century. He came to her and he healed her of her tortures and she was presented to torture again. The second time, she actually did die. Some, day, some say she was burned at the stake. And shortly after, there was an earthquake. It was known that during this earthquake, many people who saw her put to death were so edified by such a Christian example that she was, that these other people, people became Christians into the hundreds of people. And the earthquake happened, a lot of those people died, and then their death, with all the, the love of God that was involved while they, were, while they were dying, caused the conversion of other people in the future. This, this is how merit works. So um, that was the life of St. Agatha. And thanks to her, many people have lived holy lives. So when will we ever know about the victories of these people left veiled to the rest of the world. When will, we, when will we ever know, when will we ever know about the good that our Lord was doing through these people? But no one noticed it and no one paid attention. That's the reason for the general judgment. This is a you know, great secret that's been held since the beginning of the, of the Christianity, but it's not always going to be hidden. This is all going to accrue to, you know, add up to the glory of God someday. There's, there's no work that we do, you know, virtuous work that we do that our Lord is going to forget about. You know, we just, we just do the math. We're baptized because of the death of our Lord on the cross. We're baptized and we become an extension of our Lord on the cross, walking through this world. If we're doing virtuous acts, that's all part of his passion and his crucifixion and of his, his greatest prayer to his father. Just as his crucifixion is probably the greatest known historical event of all history, uh, so all of our acts, which are part of that crucifixion, are also going to be, going to be made known. That's a, um, it's a logical thing. Uh, it's, it's part of the cross, so it's going to be made known with the cross. And now we look towards the other side. We've talked about the virtuous people and how none of their good deeds can be hidden. What about the other side? We have to think of the wicked. The world has a way of honoring people who do not have much to do with our divine Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them have been openly cruel against our Lord Jesus Christ, but some may be, let's say, neutral on this question and even when they've been sort of you know, kind of ambivalent or magnanimously neutral on this question, they still have kept our Lord off on the sidelines. I'd like to tell you a little, about, a little bit about a country I lived in for almost 10 years, uh, Mexico. And um, this country won its independence from Spain in the year 1821. They had a few years of being Catholic under a monarch, but after about three years, they executed him because they did not want a Catholic government. They wanted a Masonic government, government of the Masons. So they had quite a few years of anarchy, and finally they settled upon one of their own uh, local people from their country to rule them. And... Um, this was their president. He ruled from 18, 
uh, 61, sorry, 1851 to 1862. Uh, I guess some credit is given to him for unifying the nation and so forth, but I have a hard time believing that because the nation was already unified before their independence. So, but what I know him for is stealing churches, stealing Catholic schools, stealing seminaries, monasteries, convents, and orphanages and saying, these buildings now belong to the government. All of you who are living in them must get out. The, the national eviction notice. They have a very nice word for it. They say, oh no, this was uh, expropriated. You say, oh, this is quite a nice government building. Where did you get it? Well, it used to be a monastery, but it was expropriated. Sounds like an official status. Oh, you mean it was stolen with deaths and barbar barbarism? Well, well, we don't like to say that, but yes. <laughs> That, that would be Mexico in the middle of the 19th century. And um, so this leader who did these things, uh, he is hailed as the father of the country. This is a true disgrace. And you can go to whatever city or whatever village, no matter how small, in the, in the country of Mexico, and you'll find somewhere a monument of him, a statue of him, a big painting of him or something like that, because everyone has to give reverence to this Masonic leader. And on the other hand, if you don't, if you cause some, if you de deface some of these images or what all, what what not, uh, you get fined, fined, or put in prison. So, you know, the Masonic world makes sure that we recognize and honor their Masonic. Um, well, I guess they call them heroes, Masonic heroes. I would call them Masonic um, villains. Meanwhile, think of all the Catholics that were persecuted by this wicked man. So when are we going to be able, these good people, instead of this man who apparently had the victory over them in this life? And this is an important point. And we might say, why is it that the good always get persecuted and the evil always get honored? This discourages people from being good people. And the answer is, you have to see the thing very supernaturally. If we understand from the beginning that, again, our baptism is the beginning of our life in Christ. Our baptism is the beginning of our life in the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we'll understand if, if we receive persecution and if the wicked people of this world are honored and lifted up, We'll understand that, okay, I'm going through some unfortunate things. I'm going through a form of persecution one way or another. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm doing the wrong thing. And that doesn't mean that God is not allowing this. God allows that because there are victories being won for him. And I hate to be sort of gloomy here, but even the wicked person who's behaving like that, someday he's going to hell. And his going to hell is going to give great glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Do I have to repeat that one? I will. Someday his going to hell is going to give great glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because what you have there is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the measure of all goodness, and those who do, do live according to our Lord Jesus Christ are giving glory to his goodness, and those who live against our Lord's uh, goodness, someday are going to be punished for that. And that's going to give glory to his goodness. So, you know, we have to sort of step out or step away from the scene to say these things and to think about these things uh, because otherwise it sounds like kind of like cru cruelty on my part to say such a thing. How can I be a true herald of the sacred heart of Jesus Christ if I'm saying that this man going to hell is going to give great glory to our Lord Jesus Christ? But I just gave the explanation for that. And if we sort of do the math on it, the logical reasoning on it, we, I think we all understand how this is a truth. As our Lord rewards the good for being good, this gives great glory to God. As our Lord sends souls to hell for not being good, this also gives great glory to God. Because our Lord is this measure, this yardstick of goodness. He's the divine word. We are good or not good depending on how much we um, are in accordance with him. So as you know, the truth cannot always remain silent. It is true that our Lord will not be forever ignored. In this life, we have the time of mercy. That is to say, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is always extending a hand 
to offer us forgiveness and a second chance. And thanks, to be, God, thanks be to God that he is. I mean, which of us can say uh, that, you know, we don't need to use confession that much? I think it's obvious to all of us. Uh, here are the Ten Commandments. Here are the seven sacraments. Live in accordance with the will of God. But if you slip up, and when you slip up, there's the place, the confessional, to get on the right track again. All of us are depending on this forgiveness and second chance, third chance, fourth chance of the sacred heart of Jesus. He's always making conversion and sanctification of the sinner available and possible. And all of us are um, beneficiaries of that. If our Lord wet, lets the wheat and the cockle grow up together, it's because a lot of times the cockle can turn into wheat, good wheat. I know it doesn't happen like that in you know, botany, but it does happen like that in souls. What a miracle. And a lot of times that cockle turns into wheat because the wheat is making sacrifice for their conversion. That's our job. But things do come to a close. And this is when the season of mercy comes to a conclusion. And this is when the season of judgment begins. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Our Lord cannot remain forever a hidden divinity. Sooner or later, all of his righteousness and all of his, all of his power are going to be made known. And these things are going to be made known precisely because he is good. If our Lord didn't reward the good, he wouldn't be good. If our Lord didn't punish the wicked, he wouldn't be good. So he'll make it known by exposing to all the world who the good people are, and what are all the heroic things that they did in order to bring about the reign of Christ the King? And he'll explo expose their prayers and their sufferings and their sacrifices. He'll make it known to the whole world what their victories were over the wicked ones, all the conversion of sinners, all the graces that came to souls because of them, all the sancti sanctification of people that happened because of their sacrifices. It will be beautiful. It will be beautiful. I know we have a tendency to think of the last judgment, general judgment, second coming of Christ as something only to be feared, which is healthy, but also it will be glorious to see our Lord so glorified in all the ways that these saints made sacrifices for him. And hopefully, my dear faithful, hopefully we'll be on the list. I'm not saying that we're going to live the life, lives of monks. I'm not saying that we're going to have the death of St. Agatha. But, you know, we're going to church, we're receiving the sacraments, we're being um, not just representatives, but we are members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're living in this world, and hopefully we're being a witness to him every day. Well, our Lord is going to give credit for that, and that will be part of the beauty of the second coming and the last judgment. Hopefully that will be us there. But then we have the other side, the damned. Our Lord will not be silent forever. On Calvary, our Lord prayed for his enemies. He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that was not a prayer just, um, I don't know, just sort of act against what you really feel like doing, so say that you're praying for your enemy. No, our Lord really meant it. In every you know, strike of the nail against his hand or against his foot was a prayer of our Lord for the very person who was doing that to him. And he really meant it. And in many cases, he obtained the, the, the conversion of those people. He obtained the conversion of me or you by that prayer. Because all of us have helped to put the nail into his hand, nail into his foot. He really meant it. And he obtained our forgiveness, our, our conversion. Because this is the time of mercy. This is the time to profit from his redemption. But eventually, according to the gospel today, that time will pass and it will be the time to rake in the benefits of those who have profited from the redemption, as well as a time to collect all those who have worked against the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. The people who simply would not, meaning they had no desire to have anything to do with the mercy of our Lord. There will be a gathering of the goats on the left the figurative sense of goat. It's a rebellious animal compared to the lamb. Hopefully we will be the lambs. There'll be a gathering of the goats on the left and sending them all to hell. But they don't get to go that easily, even though hell is a horrible place to go. 
It's not going to be that easy. First of all, the whole world must see their evil. No one's getting off that easy. And according to the sermon that Father Gomis is giving today, that will be just one moment to see all the evil of all the world put together. But all the world will see it. Please pray that none of us are in that group. It's all up to us. Are we going to use the confessional? Are we going to make good communions? Are we going to make the sacrifice of the Mass into the sacrifice of our own life? That's up to us under the influence of grace, but it still depends ultimately on us. Our Lord endured a lot of harsh treatment, and he did that in order to offer them the chance for conversion. How many times did these people refuse the invitations to live the supernatural life? How many times was grace offered them, but they prefer to do things in their own naturalistic way without grace? And grace became kind of like a reproach to their conscience, and they got angry with grace, and they said, get out of the way. As they spoke to our Lord, we will not have this man to rule over us. And in modern day that would be translated to I don't want that priest to have anything to do with my life I don't want this person or that person who is good to have anything to do with my life I'll stay away from them this will be a great shame for them but it'll be a great glory for God who has been waiting for their conversion and they would not have it the reparation they will make in hell will be adequate for all the wickedness they have caused against our Lord. So there is a lot of wickedness perpetrated against our Lord. If the, if the reparation in hell is adequate to that, it must be a lot of reparation. So I'll close with one paragraph, which comes from a very good author, speaking of the last judgment. He says, O Jesus, who then art to come to deliver thy church, and avenge that God who has so long borne every sort of insult from his creature, man. That day of thy coming will indeed be terrible to the sinner. He will then understand how the Lord hath made all things for himself. All, even the ungodly, who on the evil day are to show forth the divine justice. There it is. They give glory to God by going to hell. The whole world fighting on his side against the wicked shall then at last be avenged, for that slavery of sin which had been forced upon it. Think of the early virgin martyrs. That slavery of sin which had been forced upon it. Apparently evil was allowed to triumph, but the good were doing so much good in that situation. No, they are the ones who won. Vainly will the wicked cry out to the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from the face of him that will then be seated on his throne. The abyss will refuse to engulf them, in obedience to him who holds the keys of death and of hell, it will give forth to a man its wretched victims and set them at the foot of the dread tribunal. O Jesus, how magnificent will thy power then appear. The heavenly host will also be standing around thee, forming thy brilliant court and assembling thy elect from the four quarters of the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.